Hello and welcome to the Sea of Startups, where we dive into the stories behind the startups in Southeast Asia. I'm your host, Kevin Brocklin, Managing Partner of Indelible Ventures. Now, if you're a founder or funder looking to learn more about what drives the startups in Southeast Asia, this podcast is for you. We're about to sit down with founders to uncover the unique insights into the origins and motivations behind launching their startups. We'll uncover the stories behind the struggles, the ups, the downs guided from the view of an entrepreneur. So without any further ado, let's jump into today's show. Right. I am really excited today because we have Ramachandran Muniandi, the co-founder of Asia Mobility. For those of you who don't know, Asia Mobility is a mobility as a service mass company. Thank you very much for being here, Ram. Thank you, Kevin, for having me on your show. So I'm always interested to know with every founder that I meet, take me back. What is the founding story? How did you come up with the idea and what was the, the inspiration for launching? Sure. Um, I love saying that story because it takes me back to the real reason why, why we founded the business. Me and my co-founder, Pranish Chandran, um, um, he, he, he's this, he was the CEO of a large media organization here and we have been friends back then um, so this was four years ago in 2018 when we founded Asian Mobility and and up to that point I've known Prem for about a decade or so um, we were we were actually neighbors we were one street away we lived one street away from each other um, and and uh, up up to that point uh, we have only been friends because we were neighbors and and uh, we've got a similar passion for nation building uh, and we see each other at least once a year in his uh, you know, Deepa Bali open house and his wife uh, is a great cook and, and you know, so that's once a year I will see Prem. Um, but in 2018, um, both of us felt that it was time to do something new um, for our nation, Malaysia. And uh, if you know, 2018 was when we had that major political change in Malaysia. Of course, everybody was involved and everybody played their part and we all did that in our small, you know, limited capacity. Um, but in it was in that space of time that both me and Prem uh, on our own both felt uh, a need, a call, an urge to go and venture out and build a new business that solves a new problem in Malaysia. And um, I started looking out, um, I have been an entrepreneur before um, and uh, then in, but in you know, 2018 I, I was part of a larger non-profit organization uh, then I was thinking that I should go back to being an entrepreneur but this time there were a few things that I want to change as to how I did it from the last time I want to look for a co-founder that I can work with um, and, and partner with and really um, uh, work at solving uh, some on the ground problems here in Malaysia um, and, and as I started looking out um, on my social media feed pops out this posting from Premish. Um, says, hey, uh, I'm looking for co-founders and, and want to work on a great idea together. I'm like, oh, such timing. So I reached out and then we had a conversation. And the next thing we know, both of us realized that we need each other. Um, he needs a technical co-founder and I needed somebody who has, who is wanting to start up a business together. Um, and, and we both landed on transport and mobility. Um, and, uh, you, know, he, you know, Prem shared with me that that apart from news and media, his other passion is transportation, which I didn't know. Um, and then Prem discovered that uh, one of my earlier startups, uh, you know, 10 years prior to that, was um, a you know, mobility you know, company, which at that point I didn't realize it was a mobility startup. Um, and, and he was very interested in what I built 10 years prior to that. Uh, and he said, look, this, this is what I need. Um, and so lo and behold, we said, okay, look, let's do this. Um, let's found a company in order to solve this problem. That one, that one problem that we wanted to solve was where is my bus? Uh, and and uh, up to today in Malaysia, that's still a problem. Uh, but now we've got a solution. We know how to fix it. Uh, but four years ago, we we thought the technology is there for us to give a scalable solution to this problem. Um, and where is my bus uh, needs to be answered because that's the primary people mover, and our cities need buses to work. Um, and so that is what we did. We then uh, founded the business in, 
in order to provide the technology for passengers to find their buses. Um, and then over time, it grew. Over time, then we realized, okay, now we know how to do that for buses, but that alone isn't solving the problem of you know, mobility in the city. We needed to become a mobility as a service technology company. And so we grew from there. Yeah, so, so that's, that's the founding story. So, so le leading from that, uh, for the, for those uh, in the audience that don't know exactly what mobility as a service is, what what is it that you evolved into? What is mobility as a service? Great. Uh, the it's the best sort of an analogy is like Netflix versus going to the cinema. Um, so rather than paying for a movie, you you buy a subscription for as many movies as you want. So the idea of being able to move from point A to point B must migrate from a per trip journey to a service subscription model. Uh, that's mobility as a service, much like software as a service, mm -hmm. movie as a service, and mobility as a service. So that's what it is. Uh, but obviously, it's a lot more complicated than a streaming movies platform, simply because uh, a city has got many different ways of you to move about. There are many transport service providers. Uh, there are many um, sort of the different you know, data requirements, how you bought a train versus how you bought um, a ride, hailing ride is so different. Um, and so, so hence, it's a lot more complicated. Uh, it's a lot more complex. Um, and therefore, we had to then engineer um, a solution from the ground up, also taking into account that we are building for the developing world. We are building for a city like Kuala Lumpur where it doesn't have first world data infrastructure. Uh, transport service operators struggle with data a lot here. Uh, the passengers struggle with data. Uh, the government struggle with data here. So we, we had to architect a new mobility as a service platform that would enable a city like Kuala Lumpur in an emerging nation um, to fast track itself from being able to not know where its bus is to be able to get to a stage where you could subscribe to a you know, mobility service for unlimited rides across all modes of transport. So that's what we do. We build a platform. So it's not a single product that solves this problem. Uh, you've got to build the technologies from the vehicle to the passenger. And that is the platform in order to enable mobility as a service in our cities. So zeroing in on that starting point with the buses, because one of the key issues is that there, there's they have timetables in regards to when they're supposed to come by, but they're more of a guide than a reality in many cases. And it's it's not a unique experience to hear. Many many cities uh, struggle with this as well. How do you address that to be to be able to overcome that gap? Because there's a reliability aspect in order to understand and predict where each of those buses are at any given point in time. Yeah. Yeah. So there are you know, two things at play here if you are talking about using you know, um, you know, technology and data in order to improve uh, bus services in particular. Um, these are ground-based services, so obviously they are going to be subject to traffic conditions. Um, so that's one. You must be able to uh, plan bus journeys um, with a view into real-time traffic conditions. And that's when you start giving very reliable ETAs to passengers to query where is my bus, right? And so one is being able to digitize all of that and make journey planning more intelligent in the same way you journey plan for driving now where you've got fairly reliable traffic conditions uh, if you drive about in a city like here either you're using uh, Waze or you're using google maps uh, they're fairly accurate right uh, if you're driving so that same experience needs to be translated to public transit so if you're going to take public transit, um, can systems provide me with a reliable ETA? For that to happen, obviously you need to track the vehicles and then you need to pair that with real-time traffic conditions and you actually need to do prediction in terms of what time do I predict for this bus to arrive at this bus stop, right? Um, so, so it's a lot more complex than say me driving from point A to point B. Uh, because you driving from point A to point B is, is uh, you know, basically one stop away but a bus has got many stops chained together. And so you've got to be able to predict that backlog sometimes. You've got to be able to predict, is the bus now running faster? Is it going to arrive faster than the timetable? That's number one. That's being able to digitize existing services where it's there's a fixed timetable, there's a fixed route. So the stops are fixed, the timetable is fixed. Now I'm actually tracking compliance against that, right? So that's, that's the first one. Um, and then number two is to be able to actually use technology in order to improve the way these buses run in the first place. Now, that's where new forms of transit 
uh, is possible. For example, we are using um, um, right hailing services, we are using APIs, we are using cloud technologies in order to enable DRT services, that's demand responsive transit services. So that's, uh, you know, uses the same bus, it looks like a conventional bus service, but there's no fixed route, there's no fixed timetable, it's on demand buses, right? And that basically takes the entire time, the need to comply to a timetable and throw it out of the window. A bus will never be late in that sense, because the bus only moves when there is a booking, right? Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, being able to use technology and algorithms uh, in order to power new transit services. So that's basically taking the whole old bus model into the 21st century. Um, so that's what we are doing in order to solve this problem. So existing bus services that are meant to do point to point or fixed stops, we that's not going to go away. There will be certain modes or certain routes in the city that's best served like that. We need to be able to digitize that so that they can plan their journey better. And secondly, introduce new transport services using maybe bus or smaller capacity vehicles like a van, like an 18-seater shuttle, uh, in order to do first mile, last mile services. So buses can't get everywhere, especially the larger buses, and therefore you need to be able to still move you know, people about scalably and sustainably, um, rather than going right hailing, which is one passenger in a vehicle, you go um, uh, higher capacity vehicles, you use algorithms to group the bookings, and so it's, it's, it's a new form of a bus transport service. So that's what we're doing. So once you do that, then your buses become very reliable. That's 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 re that's really interesting, but it's it seems like quite the uphill battle in order to to be able to put all this together because it, essentially you're connecting a multimodal transport system, which requires a lot of integrations from a data standpoint, and some of the data perhaps may not actually be existent, perhaps with some of the bus systems. Uh, and and so forth. So how do you address that from the creation of the data to the aggregation of the data all the way down through the analysis? Yeah, so we had to take it step by step. Um, we, we have a platform to build and not just an app to build. And so because of that, we had to solve the problem like a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, which so you start with the corners uh, it's how you build a puzzle you start with the corners and then you move your way in um, and and so that's what we had to do from a technology you know development point of view we had to build uh, the anchors of the platform and the anchors uh, there is an IOT anchor there is a you know journey planning engine anchor there is a transit tech anchor in terms of being able to generate transit feeds from you know telematics data so we had to identify new anchors uh, for this because the mobility as a service ecosystem in a developing world is markedly different from if we were doing this in New York or in Paris uh, or or even in Singapore for that matter right uh, I don't have to build those anchors I just have to build an app uh, simply because the data APIs are made available already um, but we don't have that luxury here we don't have that luxury in a lot of the developing world and therefore we had to build new anchors and build uh, you know products that can work on their own solving one problem but when they work with each other they can enable a new service so for example um, we have got an iot solution that is made for public transit telematics uh, that's where we solve the data generation problem so if you run a bus service here and you want to be able to say look i need a, what they call a gps tracker on my bus uh, we provide the telematic solution for that. That same telematic solution is used by the fleet management to, to manage their fleet, but at the same time, it also produces transit feeds on the cloud for us. So it's completely integrated. You install this device on your bus and your bus appears on Google Maps, right? That's, that's, that's the magic, right? And that is what they need. And so in order to do that, we had to build that you know, data uh, uh, pipeline from from uh, device so we need to have iot capabilities uh, in the team we needed to be able to you know deploy that and then use that data and ingest that data in a way that we can then use that for journey planning and so that's how we you know tackle that problem so now transport operators um, have got a value added of using our solution because now they are fixing they are basically killing two birds with one stone here you know previously they are using you know telematics for fleet management no benefit to the passenger the passenger does not see the bus there's no way to get that you know data across to the passenger but now using the same solution you do you do fleet management but at the same time we are publishing transit feeds and we are doing that in our you know, journey planning engine as well so we are connecting your bus to the passenger and so that's how we have been able to slowly win over the market over time uh, but the but the but the cool thing with this of the great thing of being ahead of the curve 
uh, is the fact that that once the market catches up to you, uh, the entire market is at your disposal. So we have we have had to very very uh, you know disciplined uh, with how we fundraise, how we use our money, and and how we build the team. Um, and, and that has you know, resulted to us being able to piece together all the pieces of the puzzle quietly um, that, that we'll be able to now turn it all on um, and, and uh, help our cities jumpstart. So le- let me ask you on this pathway to growth, because essentially you're, 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 you're essentially doing a form of mass matchmaking between the ultimate end users while also trying to get enough supply of different modes of transportation, whether buses, uh, ride hailing, so on and so forth. So when you looked at building it up to begin with, how did you put your focus in regards to building those edges of the puzzle? Uh, and then striking up the relationships because you have to end up getting relationships with the public transport operators, some of the independent buses, and really going through the list. So how did you approach that strategically so that you were balancing both sides of this mix? Yes. So we had we had to, one of the first major decisions we had to make early on was what is our model here? Are we are in a business to business model, are we straight to the consumer? Um, obviously, the idea or the appeal of uh, you know multimodal journey has always been on the consumer side, right? I want to be able to plan for my journeys seamlessly across all modes on a single app, you know, discover everything, and then I get to choose. And and so obviously that app still does not exist here, right? And so the appeal um, at the start was, can we build that app? Do we have the technology to do that? And so which which we did, right? Uh, and that got us our first funding. Um, and that was from a strategic investor who wanted to build something similar to that. Um, and so we built that. But after a while, we realized that that isn't the edge of the puzzle. That is simply one of the pictures in the puzzle. That's not the that's not the piece of the puzzle. It's a picture in the puzzle. Uh, so, But in building the app, while at the same time investing in IoT, right, which was an anchor, which was a corner of the puzzle, um, was then we realized that okay, knowing what an app, what a you know, consumer app needs, is what we needed to know and discover for ourselves, so that we can build the right APIs to power those apps. Then we became a pure B two B model, right? Because then we knew what an app required, we knew uh, what the you know, consumer side wanted. We 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 did a deep dive on the consumer side. We built an app like a showcase app. Um, and then said, look, this will remain as a showcase app. We are, this is not our business anymore. Now we are focusing on the APIs that power such an app. And, and so it is through a discovery process like that that got us into a sweet spot, which is a B2B or a, at most a B2B2C model, whereby we are powering the mobility experience. So we provide the APIs and we you know, provide the engine in order to enable mobility as a service in super apps in other you know digital ecosystems and we find that that, that that's where the you know developing world needs that uh, uh, this would not be a model in the first world country this this but this this is this is proving to be working here so that's how we did it we actually went after low low you know hanging fruits uh, what the market wanted what the funders wanted to see what the you know uh, investors uh, uh, found to be exciting but at the same time being able to stick true to our cause, uh, which is to be able to help people move about their cities in a safer, uh, more comfortable, more reliable way. And because we knew that, you know, if you improve how people move about, you improve their lives. Um, and and so we, 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 we were on the same lane, it's just that uh, we tried some things and then that validated the strategy. And then once once, once we had that going, and and once we had the first customer, and that customer st- stuck with us for four years now, uh, we saw that we are on the right track, uh, uh, and and we maintain partnerships. So it's it's like you know what you said, right? There are so many uh, sort of actors uh, in the industry here that we are in. So many actors, uh, all the different transport operators. They are you know government owned, they are private owned. Um, some are in the city, some are outside of the city. Uh, it actually required us to be a to be an ecosystem builder, um, and that means we are constantly finding partners and working with partners in finding new solutions and co-creating new solutions. So that is that is the you know that is that has been the approach and that will continue to be the approach for us. 
And so when you're looking at customers and you're looking at the, the, the availability of mobility solutions within certain areas, is your focus on density or how do you view coverage gaps? Because I know in Kuala Lumpur specifically, there are a lot of coverage gaps where public transportation just does not reach. And it's not the elite areas exclusively that are, that are shrugging it away. There's many people who need it that simply do not have. So how do you view that? when tackling this, especially from kind of a mission-oriented standpoint? Yeah, absolutely. So that is why uh, we decided that, that you know, when, when we looked at the problem here, it wasn't just a you know, data connectivity problem. It wasn't just the fact that you know, data wasn't available. It was a transit connectivity problem, first mile, last mile problem, right? Uh, which just by solving the data isn't going to solve that problem. But using technology, we then find new services in order to provide first mile, last mile services like on-demand buses, for example. Uh, that is the reason why you know public transport has not has not had a uh, great coverage simply because it's too expensive to run it in the conventional model where you've got fixed routes and fixed timetables. Buses should not run like trains. They, 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 there are no tracks for buses, it roads, right? So, but why do we run buses like trains? Uh, and when you run a bus like train, the train is running even though there's no passenger. Uh, and that's how our buses run. And that is why it's so expensive to run public transport services. So we need, we had to bring, uh, look at ways in order to bring down the cost of running public transit services so that we can fill what we call these, you know, desert areas where there's no public transit. Can we run smaller capacity vehicles? Can a van, can, can a fleet of vans, for example, 10 seater vans function as a first mile, last mile service for some of these underserved areas? Yes. Absolutely, why not? Right hailing has stepped into that space already, but they're not solving the problem uh, because it's the you know a, you know right hailing service is never designed as a public transit service. It is it is a taxi replacement, right? That's that's the you know nature of right hailing, Grab and you know Uber and all. It's a taxi, re it's a cab replacement. Now a cab replacement service is not public transit. Uh, it's it's so 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 hence that is where the breakdown happens. So we want to be able to see how best to also fix the you know desert areas where there is a transit gap. But how we do that is actually by using technology. So so then can we build all of that into the same platform? One platform in order to solve this problem. Once you do that, then you're filling in the gaps. So once you fill in the gaps, then you know mobility as a service end to end is possible. And, and with that, you wouldn't actually be operating any of the vehicles that would be filling in any of these transport deserts. It would simply be enabling the players that are in the market and providing them with technology to where they can expand their services or actually make them more efficient and service the public, those that need it, uh, in a more cost-effective way. Absolutely, a hundred percent. So we we are we are a B two B business or a B two B two C business. So we are going to enable. We are we are basically helping public transport operators go digital, uh, go on demand, run new services that is powered by technology, um, and and so we are going to power that. So we're going to be we are actually operator agnostic. We serve all operators, um, and and uh, we are also transport mode agnostic. So uh, we help right hailing you know providers. Um, um, work hand in hand with public transport. So we aggregate that, right? Uh, so the more options, the merrier for everybody. And that creates a network effect. And that also creates more sustainable multimodal journeys. <clears throat> and and uh, so that's what we do. So we are still asset light. We don't operate any of the vehicles. We work with fleet transport operators to do that. So let me ask you on that, and it, and it comes into more of a sales and customer style of a question. When you're approaching some of these public transportation operators, I have to imagine, and maybe this is a misconception of mine, that they probably don't understand technology to the full extent. What is the learning curve like when you're trying to explain your service offering? Oh, yes. Uh, in the first couple of years, I would say, in the first, in the first two years prior to the pandemic, so our you know history somehow is marked by the you know pandemic at about um, so now we are four years old as at about a midway point uh, the you know pandemic struck um, and so so we had a, you know BC moment and an AD moment right <laughs> so the BC moment was you know pre you know pandemic where uh, everybody that we spoke to a lot of people that we spoke to so the 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 you know citizenry loved it loved the idea that finally somebody is working in solving this problem. Transport operators and, and the guys who are who are in the space say, look, it's too big a problem for you guys to solve. Like, 
Like, and, and why is there a need for this, right? Um, the buses are late anyway. So they didn't understand that if there's no timetable, your buses can't be late, right? So <laughs> even even that statement alone, right? That statement alone has, has you know, tripped up so many transport operators. Because uh, they say, look, uh, I love technology and app, but my driver is constantly late and, and he's not following the timetable. But I say, look, if your you know, ETA shows that he's late, um, then he's actually not late in that sense. There's no timetable for him to follow. And, and it was like a light bulb moment that goes up and I could see it and they would be speechless for the next two minutes and for it to sink in that if there's no timetable, my buses cannot be late. And that means I am being measured by the ETAs that the system provides to the passenger who is making the query, right? Um, and, and so that, that has been the journey. But after the pandemic, the market caught up. Now it's no longer a case of why do we need to have this, now it's when can we have it. So we're having a different sort of discussions um, uh, with the same clients that we spoke to before. Uh, and and uh, that has accelerated everything for us. So in that sense, we had to weather and, and stay the course of the pandemic in order for us to reap the benefits of the recovery, uh, reap the benefits of being ahead of the curve two years before the pandemic struck. Um, but uh, in that sense, a platform strategy works because we are not, we are not going to compete with anybody. Uh, we are not saying, look, use our app, don't stop you know, using your app. I don't have an app, right? I'm powering your app. Um, and so that required us to actually build a very strong engineering expertise um, to be able to integrate, customize, being able to solution architect every, every solution that we need. So every transport operator, say they, they would like something unique and something customized about they're offering and that's what we are able to do and that's the power of a platform. So let, let me shift gears because you said it requires a big engineering effort. So I want to focus on the talent side because no matter what a company is building, talent always stands at the center because it's the people that build, it's the people that operate. How have you been able to scale up your team and do you have any challenges to note in regards to being able to find the appropriate talent set? I started up the company with guys whom I know. And so it's it's the founder's team, right? Mm. Um, so so it's guys who have either worked with me before in a previous organization or worked for me before. Um, and so I reached out to them and, and they heard my vision and they saw who I was partnering with and they were convinced these guys know what they're doing. Let's trust them for the next year or so. <laughs> uh, so, 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 you know, this guy said, yeah, I said, look, uh, uh, you know, come along for the journey. It's a it's, it's a it's a big adventure if you can please you know uh, you've got a runway for that so being able to find guys who can do that as well um, and then being able to last the distance with them right and and so I've been fortunate enough uh, that that I've had guys who are with me uh, uh, for since day one uh, and they have grown with us uh, my my first hire uh, was a guy who worked with me before in a previous organization he was trained as an aerospace engineer so he's kind of like fits in this space, right? Uh, and, and, but not much official software engineering training, uh, but really bright and wanted to learn and want, and had some experience in that area. So I said, look, come and learn and come and lead a fledgling team. Now he's my director of engineering. Um, the second guy um, was an architect, used to work with me as well in a previous organization. Uh, has never been in a tech startup before, but both of these guys are good friends. So one, you know, convinced the other, hey, let's do this. And I know both of them, um, and and he has grown with us uh, four years now. He's the you know he's my you know director of programs management. Um, he's an architect. Uh, so being able to, I think, um, find the right people who may not necessarily check the qualifications checkbox. Uh, has allowed me to not hire people, but much rather bring people on a journey instead. Obviously, I'm paying them, but they are not they are not hires per se. I don't see them as hires. I see them as uh, the founders team, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then over time, then these guys, uh, it's 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 by word of mouth actually. They they then convince their friends to come on the journey. Say, hey, we're building something that's going to change the nation, right? Uh, but but you know that is what it is. It's very mission driven, um, and but. After a while, you run out of you run out of you know people whom you know. Then you've got to start hiring and put ads out, and that's what we have done. Uh, but being able to use that as a template of finding right people, 
Um, so while I while I don't hire you know people that, whom whom I have got first hand you know knowledge of, but I'm hiring people whom I know is a good fit with the founders team. Um, and and uh, but but I think the growth the growth pace that we are on as well we we have grown slowly and in a very measured way. Um, does not require me to go on a hiring spree. Mm -hmm. um, we never had to do that. Um, and therefore, that has allowed us to be very conscientious um, and responsible with our hires. Uh, so we are hiring one or two at a time. Uh, it's a very different growth strategy. Uh, and, and our growth moving on as well is it's you know going to not be hiring 200 people to all be in the same office right so it's going to be um, 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 almost like a you know corporate growth there's going to be a, a whole slew of you know subsidiaries and and I can then hire within those entities mm -hmm. rather than uh, all being under one HQ so it's a different growth strategy that allows me to focus on what I think our strength is that which is being able to um, uh, find right talent. Um, and grow them as well, coach them and mentor them. I think that's one of our key strengths. Okay. And how, how big is the team size at this point in time? We are at 22 right now. Um, and 85% and of that is engineering. Uh, we are slowly expanding the sales marketing side of things. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we are in the next stage of growth. So we expect to, to you know, double the size of the team over the next 12 months. Okay. And when you look at hiring, I'm curious, just philosophically, do you think it's more important to hire for a culture fit within an organization or skills fit? I think that there is, I mean, you need both. Uh, right. And, and uh, an equal measure of both according to your organization. Um, and I feel that, that you know, um, finding people who would appreciate the culture um, is necessary. They may not have a an immediate culture fit, but they like the culture. They 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 seem like that's something that they want to be a part of, right? That's good. Uh, hiring skill set is one thing. Um, we you know definitely love to hire people who have had some experience, uh, or or at least uh, in the course of the studies, we have had many fresh graduates join us. Um, so mm -hmm. experience can also be measured while you're studying, actually. Uh, what are the kind of projects you worked on? Um, we are, you know, going to look at your GitHub repos. Uh, you know, that's that counts as experience uh, mm -hmm. for me. Um, so, so those those are the kinds of, you know, hires. So there, there is definitely the skill set thing there. Uh, not so much qualifications, but skill set, yes. Um, and and then um, an appreciation of our values and our culture, definitely. Okay. So let me let me shift towards a little bit more forward looking. Um, when looking at def the definition of success for the organization or as a product, how do you define that, uh, and how has this evolved over time since your starting point? I think for any um, any organization, um, growth is a good measure of success, and uh, growth can be measured in many different ways. Obviously. One is uh, team growth. The team is growing. Uh, that's that's a sign of success. Um, you know, revenue growth, income growth, funding growth. You are you know raising more money uh, in this round. That I think is a measure of success um, for a startup, especially. And and so I see growth um, and growth in a few areas as a measure of success. Um, not so much in a product level, uh, but on an organizational level, yes simply because products are simply an outcome of your growth. So if you are, you know, if, if you are, you know, growing well as an organization, you're going to have better products. Uh, you're going to have more products. Um, so I don't look at a product per se, I look at the organization as a whole. Yeah. Okay. And if there is one specific thing that you must get absolutely right in order to maximize your odds of success, looking forward, what exactly is the one thing that you must get absolutely right? I think if you're asking a founder um, <laughs> or, as, or a CEO, for me, I think uh, a founder needs to get a lot of things right in order for his own to excel but that one thing for a founder I feel the one thing for a founder is to always um, uh, uh, be with people and being able to grow your your you know people trust your people network I think that's that is that one thing that will take you through the best and the worst of times um, and I think founders sometimes 
uh, don't get as much of an opportunity to do that or they are robbed of the opportunity simply because uh, they are being told to focus on uh, other matters um, but I think being able to be around people, being able to always meet people, being able to engage with people um, is an important thing. So, you know, being able to get that right time for me to do that. So I've got time to meet people. I've got time to, you know, engage with people. I've got time to sit down and speak to, a, you know, a whole bunch of people in a week. Uh, that, that, you know, being able to get that right, sometimes we underestimate the value of that. Um, and, and for founders, it, um, your, you know, uh, runway or your you know, opportunities is going to be marked by the people that you've already met, right? By the people that you've already met. Uh, so, so if you, if you are not seeing people and you are not meeting quality people, uh, your runway is going to be impacted, both from a funding point of view, from a growth point of view, from a revenue point of view, from a team hiring point of view, right? All of that is going to be impacted. Yeah, I, I, th I think that I think that's fantastic. Uh, there, there's there's certainly so much value out of being people centric. The 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 conversations, the outcomes that can come from it. I think that's 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 fantastic. Let me wrap up here with a couple of closing questions. The same closing questions that I ask everyone. When you look at building the organization, what is the tech tool that you just cannot live without? Oh wow. Uh, we are we use so we we are quite selective with the tools that we use. Like we don't have a uh, I mean we we have a controlled environment where we use pre-selected tools, and you're not just free to use any tools <laughs> you like to use. Uh, so for comms, there's a tool for email, there's a tool, you know, right? Um, I would say at the very least, uh, one tool that I can't live live without would be an email, like like my I, like my, you know, Google Workspace. I think that that you know, Google Workspace, the email calendar, Drive, that that combination, and and um, um, you know, uh, you know, conferencing tool. I think that selection, that tool set, is something that I can't live without. Yeah, it's 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 a power it's a powerful set of tools yeah. there. Uh, one more question here: What if if you were to talk to other founders that are just starting out? What is the biggest piece of advice that you would give another founder that's just starting out? Um, oh, uh, don't remain a founder. You've got to be a co-founder. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that. Just, it's yeah. tough to go solo. <laughs> if you're just starting out as a founder, you need to you you have to you have to migrate to be a co-founder. <laughs> that's 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 fantastic that's fantastic i love it well thank you very much ram for being here i really enjoyed the conversation there's some incredible points that you have made very much appreciated thank you kevin for you know having me it's such a pleasure talking to you oh. All right, that wraps it up for another fantastic episode of The Sea of Startups. If you've enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend, go on to iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a review. It's the best way for us to get discovered and to have these startup stories reach a broader audience. If you have any suggestions or would like to get in touch, you can email me at kevin at indelible.vc. As always, I'm your host, Kevin Brocklin from Indelible Ventures, and this is the Sea of Startups.